Today we're going to begin chapter 5, which deals with the chemistry of acids and bases. Before we get into the details, chemical reactions and such, let's take a look at some of the everyday properties of these materials. Acids are normally sour. If you taste lemon juice, it has a very sour taste because it contains citric acid. Same thing is true of vinegar. Vinegar contains acetic acid, which makes it very sour. Now, most food products contain acids. That sour taste is actually pleasing if you cut it with other things. For example, oil and vinegar salad dressing. The vinegar gives it that sort of zing with the uh, acetic acid and then all of the uh, different herbs and, that you put in there moderates that. It makes it a very pleasant taste. If you've ever watched the show Chopped, they'll often tell the contestants, you know, you need more acid in that food. And so they might use lemon juice or vinegar to do that. Now, bases, on the other hand, taste bitter, which is really bad. I'm not going to actually taste a base, and I don't necessarily recommend you do it either. But if you've ever had your mouth washed out with soap, it tastes really bad. Liquid plumber or Drano, the drain cleaners, are very powerful bases. You have to be real careful with those things. Bases have the ability to dissolve organic material, things like grease and fat and hair. And that's why we use drain cleaners, which are very basic, to clear out those organic types of materials you might get a drain clog with. On the other hand, acids tend to attack metals. Whereas acids don't do a very good job of destroying organic material, they are really good at dissolving metals. So we're going to do another demonstration here in just a moment where we're going to add some very strong base and some very strong acid to a couple of pieces of iron and see how each of those reacts. I mentioned a moment ago that bases tend to attack organic materials and acids attack metals. So we're going to test that by adding some sodium hydroxide, which is similar to the compound they have in drain cleaners, a very powerful base, and we'll add some concentrated hydrochloric acid to the other test tube. So let's go ahead and put on some safety glasses here. We'll add some sodium hydroxide to our first piece of iron, and let's see if it actually does anything to it. All right, take keep an eye on that. In a moment, we'll get a closer view, but right now it doesn't look like anything is happening. So let's go ahead and add some concentrated hydrochloric acid to the other test tube. Now, let's keep an eye on those two things. I'm already starting to see bubbles coming off from the hydrochloric acid, so why don't we move in for a closer look. Now if you look more closely, you can see that the test tube with the hydrochloric acid is turning yellow. That's because the piece of iron is actually dissolving and there's lots of bubbles of hydrogen gas coming off of that piece of metal. When we get to the next chapter, in chapter 6, we're going to learn all about chemical reactions between acids and metals, amongst other things. Now, if you take a look at the other test tube with the sodium hydroxide, clearly nothing is happening. It's interesting, I used to work at Burger King many, many years ago, decades ago, and every night we had to clean all of the grease off of the stainless steel broilers, and we would basically dunk them into a vat of sodium hydroxide. It would dissolve all of the grease and fat that had collected during the day, and it left the metal perfectly shiny and clean. Another property that acids and bases have is their ability to change chemicals called indicators to different colors. Some of you may have heard of phenolphthalein before. This flask over here, which is for a demonstration we'll be doing in a couple of minutes, has phenolphthalein in it. Phenolphthalein is pink in the presence of bases and it's colorless in the presence of acids. In the experiment that we'll be doing this week, we're going to be using a homemade indicator, which is cabbage juice. I basically ground up some cabbage, and when you watch the video for the pre-lab, you will see how all of that has taken place. 
Cabbage juice, unlike phenolphthalein, can change a number of different colors. We have these little color strips here, and you can see it goes from red to purple to blue to green to yellow. So lots of different colors. And in the video for the lab, if you want to do this at home, it shows exactly how you can repair your own cabbage juice. So acids are on the red end of this little chart. So let's put some vinegar in one of our cups. And vinegar, of course, as we mentioned a little while ago, is acidic. It contains acetic acid. Let's add some cabbage juice to it, and it turns a lovely red color, which we would expect because the pH down here of, say, 2 to 4 is in the red color range, and vinegar usually has a pH of about 2 to 3. Ammonia, on the other hand, is a cleaning product, and cleaning products are normally basic, so we would expect the cabbage juice and ammonia to change to one of the basic colors, say the blue, green, or yellow. So let's take a look. We'll add some cabbage juice to our ammonia. Ooh, and we get a lovely green color. So cabbage juice is a very handy indicator. You can use that to determine whether something is acidic or basic and even get an approximate idea of how acidic or basic it is. Now in the laboratory, Instead of using cabbage juice, chemists use something called universal indicator. So universal indicator is sort of a blend of a number of different individual indicators, each of which changes different colors at different pH values. So you can use universal indicator like you do the cabbage juice to show a variety of different colors at different pHs. So if we're going to do our next demonstration in which we're going to be using some universal indicator. Let's go ahead now and do an experiment using universal indicator. In this graduated cylinder, I've got the ionized water, and I've added a little bit of sodium hydroxide just to make it basic to start with. So let's go ahead and add some of our universal indicator. So we get a lovely, nice purple color here. little bit more in there. There we go. That's a pretty good looking purple color. Now to make the solution acidic, we're going to add to this some dry ice. Dry ice is simply frozen carbon dioxide, and when carbon dioxide dissolves in water, it forms carbonic acid. So let's go ahead and put a piece of dry ice into our container here, and watch as the pH slowly drops and the colors begin to change. So it starts out with a lovely purple color. Looks like that's already beginning to lighten up a little bit. Well, now it's moving a little more toward the blue. Oh, that's a nice blue color now. Oh, now it's green. I like that green color. And then eventually it turns yellow. Now, carbonic acid that's formed when carbon dioxide dissolves in water is not a very strong acid. So it's not going to be able to make the pH get real low here. It might only be a pH of 6 or so. If you make universal indicator even more acidic, it will change colors even beyond the yellow. So rather than wait for the uh, carbonic acid to slowly do that, let's go ahead and add a few drops of hydrochloric acid and we can speed that up. Although you can already see the yellow is beginning to get a bit of a more golden tinge here. But let's go ahead and add a few drops of the hydrochloric acid. Oh, there we go. It gets a bit of a more amber color now. It's hard for carbon dioxide to push the color that far, but if we add some hydrochloric acid to it, we can see the full range that you can get with universal indicator. Eventually, if we add enough acid to it, it turns that lovely rosé color. 
So this is a very fun demonstration to do. You can do this also with cabbage juice. If you wanted to do this at home, you can buy dry ice at the grocery store. That's where my dry ice came from. You can make cabbage juice just as I will illustrate in the lab video for this week's lab. And you can do the same type of thing in any glass container you happen to have at home. So if you decide to do that, it's a great thing to do for Halloween. Ira Rimson was a well-known chemist in the latter half of the 1800s. He's actually the person that discovered the first artificial sweetener, saccharin. He tells a story when he was working at a doctor's office as a young man, this was probably back in the 1860s or so, and he read a statement in a chemistry book that said nitric acid acts upon copper. And he was curious to know what that meant. He didn't find that a very illuminating statement. So having a copper penny in his pocket, he took it out, poured some nitric acid on it, and observed what happened. And it was pretty impressive. It was foaming and bubbling, and noxious brown smoke was coming off. He got very nervous about what to do with the penny, so he grabbed the penny with his fingers and threw it out the window. And he made another discovery, and that was that nitric acid acts upon fingers. It's a very corrosive material which is why I'm going to be wearing a glove here in a few minutes when I work with it. Once he threw the penny out the window and it began to burn his fingers, logical thing to do, he wiped his hand on his pants and made another discovery, and that was nitric acid acts upon pants. It was a rather expensive lesson, but very illuminating. He remembered that the rest of his life. And so we have a demonstration that did chemists like to do, which is called the Ivor Rimson demonstration. We're going to do it in a little more controlled fashion here by reacting our pennies with nitric acid inside this flask. So over in, in this larger flask here we have water with a little bit of phenolphthalein indicator in it. We're going to put the pennies in here, add the nitric acid, and I want you guys to watch and see what happens. Right. The first thing we'll want to do is to put two pennies into our round flask. These are old pennies before 1983 when pennies were still made of copper. You have to make sure you use a penny before 1983. Let's go ahead and add our nitric acid and then we're going to very quickly seal up this flask because it's going to start producing a rather noxious gas nitrogen dioxide. So let's observe what happens. You can see that the nitrogen dioxide is beginning to bubble over into our flask. Now the flask, the large flask is pink right now because it's basic. But nitrogen dioxide, when it dissolves in water, forms nitric acid once again and it's going to slowly turn that solution acidic. And if you remember, what does phenolphthalein do in an acidic solution? Well, you're going to see in a moment here. And, of course, it becomes clear. So the nitrogen dioxide forming in the round flask is bubbling over dissolving in the water in the larger flask and it's reforming a nitric acid solution. Now eventually, of course, our two pennies will be completely gone. So we'll watch this for a few minutes here. You can see now that the bubbling has slowed down significantly and the pennies just about reacted. There's a little piece of it still floating around on the surface of the nitric acid. It looks like the bubbling is just about done and the reaction has finished. It looks like the reaction has finished. The nitrogen dioxide now in the right hand flask is beginning to cool and as it does it's contracting and the pressure is dropping. You can see the water rising up the glass tube in the left hand flask due to that decrease in pressure. Pretty quickly the water is going to reach the top and it's going to begin to flow into our right hand flask and when it does 
things are going to get pretty interesting. Now as soon as the water starts flowing into the flask over on the right, the nitrogen dioxide starts dissolving. That creates a vacuum in the flask and the water gets pulled in ever faster. You'll notice that it was sort of a nice green color to start with, which happens when copper nitrate is very concentrated. But as it gets diluted, it becomes this lovely blue color. Let's go ahead and take a, another look at this, but we'll zoom in on that flask. That'll give you a, a bit of a better view here. You can see how quickly the water is rushing in there when the nitrogen dioxide dissolves and forms a vacuum. It's a pretty exciting demonstration. Lots of pretty colors, lots of interesting chemical reactions. I think Ira Remsen would be proud to have this demonstration named after him. Well, I hope you all enjoyed those uh, fun demonstrations. It was a good way to, to get introduced to the properties of acids and bases, but now we're going to talk about their chemistry. The first question we have to answer, of course, is what exactly is an acid? Well, there are many different definitions of what makes an acid. One of the earliest ones, back in 1887, was proposed by Svante Arrhenius, and that was that an acid is simply a substance that produces hydrogen ions when you dissolve them in water. So H plus is essentially the active ingredient of an acid. For example, if we take hydrogen chloride gas and dissolve it in water, it will produce hydrogen ions and chloride ions. Essentially, the hydrogen chloride molecule is dissociating in water to form H plus and Cl minus. Now, sometimes you'll see it written slightly different, where the water is actually considered one of the reactants. So we can write it also as the HCl and water forming a, what's called a hydronium ion, H3O+. And all that really is is a hydrogen ion attached to a water molecule. And in reality, the term aqueous means just that. In fact, the hydrogen ion is not attached to just one water molecule. It's surrounded by a lot of them, just like we learned back in Chapter 4 when we saw how sodium chloride dissolved in water and the sodium and chloride ions ended up surrounded by water molecules. So either one of these is a perfectly fine way to show the dissociation of hydro hydrogen chloride into H plus and Cl minus. This is acetic acid, which is the active ingredient in vinegar, and it also dissociates in water to form the hydrogen ion, in this case, the acetate ion. One thing you're going to notice as we go along through all the different Arrhenius acids, they have one thing in common. They all begin with hydrogen. That's going to be a very convenient way for you to recognize an Arrhenius acid. They will always begin their formula with hydrogen. Now, acids come in two different types, strong and weak. So what, what's the difference between them? HCl is what we consider a strong acid. And a, what makes an acid strong is its ability to dissociate in water and release or produce hydrogen ions. For example, if we take 100 molecules of HCl and dissolve it in water, we'll get 100 hydrogen ions and 100 chloride ions. So when all said and done, there will be no HCl molecules remaining. They will all have dissociated, and so we get a 100% conversion of the acid into hydrogen ions. That's what makes a strong acid. It's its ability to dissociate completely when it dissolves in water. Logically, then, a weak acid is one that simply doesn't dissociate completely. Acetic acid is a great example of that. Strong acids are dangerous. You've got to be careful with those. Weak acids, actually foods, as we talked about in, in our demonstrations, commonly contain weak acids. Vinegar contains acetic acid. It doesn't hurt us because it's a weak acid. The little bit of hydrogen ions it produces gives us that nice taste we like in foods, but it's not enough to actually 
cause any problems. We would not want to make oil and hydrochloric acid salad dressing. That would be really bad. Oil and vinegar, nice combination. If we take that same 100 molecules of acetic acid, only one of them actually dissociates. The other 99 remain as acetic acid molecules, and so we're only getting 1% of the possible hydrogen ions. So hydrochloric acid is essentially 100 times stronger than acetic acid. One of the things you'll have to be able to do on the quiz covering this chapter is to identify an acid as strong or weak. There are thousands of acids, and so you might think that this is going to be a very difficult process. But the good news is almost all acids are weak. There's only half a dozen strong acids, so all you really have to do is learn the strong acids. If they're not strong, then by default they're weak. Our first one, of course, is one we already talked about, hydrochloric acid, HCl. In the same family, we have HBr and HI. So that's three of our strong acids right there. There are three more, HNO3, H2SO4, and HClO4. You're going to simply need to learn those six. I try to keep memorization to a minimum, but there's a few things you will have to learn, and that's one of them. Now, learning the weak acids is going to be pretty simple. It's everything else. So if the molecule's formula begins with H, you know it's an acid. If it's not one of these six, it must be a weak acid. If it is one of those six, then we know it's a strong acid. Now, I have been giving names to these acids without really telling you how we do that. Acids have their own special naming conventions. It's, it's not the same as other substances. Acids are all covalent compounds, but they're not named exactly like all the other covalent compounds. The way we name them is dependent upon what kind of acid it is. So we have two classes, binary acids and oxy acids. A binary acid, binary simply means two. So a binary acid has only two elements. One of them, of course, has to be hydrogen and then some other element. To name them, all of the binary acids' names begin with hydro for hydrogen. Then we put in the name of the element that's with the hydrogen. We, so chlorine becomes chlor, and then we end all of the binary acids with the suffix ic, so hydrochloric acid. In this case, since it's got bromine instead of chlorine, it becomes hydrobromic acid, and HI would be hydroiodic acid. So the, the center of each of these is simply representing the other element in the, in the acid besides the hydrogen. There are a couple of other binary acids. We have HF, which is hydrofluoric acid, and H2S, which is hydrosulfuric acid. You'll notice that I put two hydrogens with the sulfur, and the reason for that is very simple. Sulfide ions have a negative two charge, so of course they would need two H plus ions to balance them out. Chlorine, bromine, iodine, and fluorine only form a negative one ion, and thus we would only need one hydrogen. Oxy acids, not surprisingly, contain oxygen. In fact, the thing you're going to notice is not only do they contain oxygen, but they all contain a polyatomic ion. You'll notice that NO3 is the nitrate ion. So when you're naming an oxy acid, the name is based on that polyatomic ion's name. This acid is called nitric acid. We simply take nitrate and we change the ending to ic. So eight simply becomes ic. This is the acetate ion. It becomes acetic acid. We again just change that ending. Now what happens if it's in the same family like 
HNO2 has a nitrite ion. We still we can't call it also nitric acid. So the rule we use is whenever the polyatomic ion ends with ite, we simply change the ending to OUS. So any polyatomic ion that ends with ate, like nitrate and acetate, the acid ends with ic. If the polyatomic ion ends with ite, we simply use the ending OUS. ClO3 is the chlorate ion. It becomes chloric acid. You'll notice it's not the same as hydrochloric acid. We have to be able to tell those two apart, and that's where the prefix hydro comes from. If there's a hydro in front of it, we know it's a binary acid. If there's no hydro, then we know it's an oxy acid. CO3 is the carbonate ion it becomes carbonic acid. HBRO. BRO is the hypobromite acid, so it becomes hypobromous acid. So if it ends with ite, OUS. If it ends with eight, IC. So you can take any of the polyatomic ions that we learned back in chapter three, and then you can convert those to the corresponding acid by simply adding enough hydrogen ions to balance out the charge. We put two hydrogens with the carbonate because it had a negative two charge. These other polyatomic ions all had a negative one charge. We only had to have one hydrogen. So sulfate with a negative two charge would take two hydrogens sulfate becomes sulfuric acid. Now let's take a look at what makes something a base. Arrhenius also had a definition for bases just as he did with acids. And in his definition, a base was something that produced hydroxide ions when dissolved in water. Very common base is sodium hydroxide. We've used that in a number of our different experiments. Sodium hydroxide is an ionic compound. It is soluble in water, as we learned back in Chapter 4, so it dissociates to form sodium ions and hydroxide ions. Now, ammonia, you might look at that and think, well, how could that be a base? Because it doesn't contain any hydroxide. But keep in mind the definition, it's a substance that produces hydroxide ions when dissolved in water. When you dissolve ammonia in water, the ammonia pulls an H plus ion out of the water molecule, leaving a hydroxide ion behind. So ammonia is a base by this definition, just like sodium hydroxide. Like acids, bases come in strong and weak. So sodium hydroxide, if we take a hundred sodium hydroxides and we dissolve it in water, we'll get a hundred sodium ions and a hundred hydroxide ions, which means there'll be none of the sodium hydroxides remaining. We get a hundred percent conversion. So just like with acids, if every single one of the acids or bases dissociates to form H plus or OH minus, we consider them to be strong. Ammonia is an example of a weak base. If you take a hundred ammonia molecules and dissolve them in water, you'll only get one ammonium ion and one hydroxide ion. So ammonia is about as weak a base as acetic acid was an acid. It's just a coincidence. They both happen to be one out of a hundred. That's not always the case. It might be one out of a thousand. It might be one out of 10,000. So 99 of the ammonia molecules are going to remain behind, and only one of them is going to actually react with the water to form ammonium ions and hydroxide. Ammonia is commonly used in household cleaners. The downside of ammonia is it has a very strong odor, so you don't want to, uh, to smell that. But it's not a very powerful base. If you get ammonia on your hand, it's not going to hurt you.
Sodium hydroxide, on the other hand, if you leave it on your skin long enough, it will literally dissolve the flesh. It dissolves organic matter very efficiently, just like I mentioned during our video demonstration. So how do we distinguish between strong and weak bases? It's essentially the same approach. There are thousands of bases out there, but only a few of them are strong, which means all the rest are weak. The strong bases are very easy to learn because they're simply all of the metals from group one on the periodic table with a hydroxide. Everything else is a weak base. So on a quiz, I might give you a substance and ask you to tell me, is it a strong acid, a weak acid, a strong base, or a weak base? And what you would do first is ask yourself, does it begin with hydrogen? If it does, it's an acid. If it doesn't, then it's a base. And then you would simply use your knowledge of the list of strong acids and strong bases to decide whether it is strong or weak. Let's take a look at a few examples here. H2SO3. Immediately we see that it begins with hydrogen, so we know that it is an acid. Now we have to decide whether it is strong or weak. Well, a lot of times students will look at this and go, ooh, that's a strong acid, but it's not. H2SO4 is a strong acid. This is H2SO3. It's not on the list, therefore it's a weak acid. Um, CH3NH2. It does not begin with hydrogen, so we know it's a base. It's not a group one metal hydroxide. It's got to be a weak base. HClO4 begins with hydrogen. We know it's an acid. And it's on the list. It's one of the six that was on the list of strong acids. Magnesium hydroxide. It doesn't begin with H. And obviously containing hydroxides tells us it is indeed a base. But magnesium is not a group one metal. It's in group two. Therefore, it's a weak base. Acid-base reactions, like the name suggests, are reactions between acids and bases. When an acid and base are combined, they form an ionic compound and water. For example, if we take our most common acid and base, hydrochloric acid and sodium hydroxide, you may notice it looks a lot like a double displacement reaction that we talked about in the previous chapter. It's got that A, B plus C, D kind of format. And in fact, an acid-base reaction is another type of double displacement reaction. Double displacement is a broad category. And that's why precipitation reactions, that was just one kind of double displacement reaction. Acid-base reactions are another type. So in an acid-base reaction, it's the same type of thing. A and D go together and C and B go together. So we'll end up with the ionic compound sodium chloride and water. So water is always one of the products in one of these acid-base reactions. If we take phosphoric acid and lithium hydroxide, again the H will go with the OH, the lithium will go with the phosphate. Now, when you write the products of the reaction, it's very tempting for students to make this mistake. They see one lithium and one phosphate, and they want to write LiPO4. They see three H's and one OH, and want to write H3OH. Remember from back in our, in our previous chapter, the subscripts don't carry over to the other side. The only subscripts that do carry over is if it's actually part of the polyatomic ion. So the four on the phosphate, yes, that has to remain. But the three on the hydrogen, that can change, and it will. We need to look at the charges. For example, lithium is a plus one. Phosphate is a negative three. So clearly, it would take three lithiums to balance the phosphate. And the other product is always going to be water. So our products will be Li3PO4 and water. 
Now, of course, we also need to balance the equation. We didn't have three lithiums over here to start with, and that's okay, because we can fix that now. An easy way to balance an acid-base reaction is as follows. All you need to do is make sure that the number of H's and the number of OH's are the same, and then the number of H2O molecules will also be the same. So we have three H's, which means we will need three OH's, three lithium hydroxide, and then we will get three molecules of water. If you make sure that the H's, the OH's, and the H2O's are all the same, your equation will automatically be balanced. Perchloric acid and barium hydroxide. Again, the barium will join with the perchlorate and the hydrogen with the hydroxide. Barium is a plus two ion, therefore we need two perchlorates, and of course our other product will simply be water. Since there are two um, hydroxide ions here, we will need two hydrogen ions to balance that, and that means we will get two water molecules. At that point, the equation is completely balanced. Sulfuric acid and iron 3 hydroxide, this is about the most complicated version you can have because the H's and OH's are an even and an odd number. It's one of those common multiple of six things that we've done in the past. So the iron, of course, is going to go with the sulfate. And since the iron is a plus 3 and the sulfate is a negative 2, it would take three sulfates to balance out two irons. And, of course, water will be the other product. In this case, to get the H's and OH's to balance, we're going to need six of each. And therefore, we'll need three molecules of sulfuric acid and two of iron 3 hydroxide. That gives us six H's and six OH's. And then, of course, we'll end up with six H2O. Um, last time we finished talking about the Arrhenius definition of acids and bases, and we talked a bit about strong acids and strong bases and weak acids and weak bases. We also need some way of indicating how concentrated a solution is. You can have a strong acid but have very little of it, and the solution will not be very acidic. And same thing with bases. So the pH system is something that's used for people to measure how strongly acidic or strongly basic a particular solution is. As we learned last time, an acid is a substance that produces hydrogen ions in water, and a base produces hydroxide ions. It turns out that water itself can actually dissociate, just as acids and bases do. So when water dissociates, it produces both a hydrogen ion and a hydroxide ion. So could we classify water as an acid? Yes, we can, because it meets the definition of producing hydroxide or hydrogen ions. We can also classify water as a base because it produces hydroxide ions. So water is actually both an acid and a base. Mathematically, the pH is defined as the negative log of the hydrogen ion concentration. So those brackets around the H plus simply means the concentration of the hydrogen ion in the water. And the units of this are moles per liter. We haven't actually learned about moles yet, so don't worry about that. Just accept the fact that the mole is a certain amount. And so the greater the concentration, the greater that number will be. To calculate the pH, you simply put in the hydrogen ion concentration in your calculator and then press the log button. And I will make a little video later on to show you how to do that on your own calculator. Once you've done that, you simply change the sign to make it the negative log, and that's your pH. When a water molecule dissociates, since it's splitting in half, you're going to get an equal amount of hydrogen ions and hydroxide ions. 
In the case of water, it dissociates only a very tiny amount. So you get 1 times 10 to the minus 7th moles per liter of both hydrogen ions and hydroxides. That's like about 1 10 millionth of a mole. If you take the negative log of the H plus concentration, the 1 times 10 to the minus 7th, we end up with a pH of 7. Uh, a lot of you may be aware of the fact that a neutral solution has a pH of 7, and this is why, because the hydrogen ion concentration in water just happens to be 1 times 10 to the minus 7th. It's not a coincidence that the exponent and the pH are the same. Anytime the amount of hydrogen ion is 1 times 10 to some power, then the uh, pH will be whatever that exponent is. If the coefficient is not 1, then it will be different. Vinegar contains acetic acid, and thus the hydrogen ion concentration will be higher than you would find in water. So keep in mind that with negative exponents, the smaller the number, the greater the value is. So 1 times 10 to the minus 4th power is actually a thousand times bigger than 1 times 10 to the minus 7th. So if you take the negative log of the 1 times 10 to the minus 4th, we get a pH of 4. Ammonia is a cleaning product, and thus it's basic. So the hydrogen ion concentration in ammonia is less than 1 times 10 to the minus 7th, while the hydroxide concentration is greater. Again, if we take the negative log of the H plus concentration, since it's 1 times 10 to the minus 11th, the pH is simply 11. Okay. Unlike pure water, tap water contains a number of different chemical compounds, and therefore its pH is not exactly 7, and it's not perfectly neutral. So if our tap water has, has an H plus concentration of 3.5 times 10 to the minus 6th, we can't simply take the 6 and make that the pH. We'll actually have to plug that value into the calculator and take the log of that. And if you do, you'll come up with a pH of 5.46. Since 3.5 times 10 to the minus 6th is greater than 1 times 10 to the minus 7th, it should be an acidic pH, and 5.46 is a bit on the acidic side. All right, now let's use our tap water example, and I'll show you how to uh, put that information into the TI-30XA calculator and figure out your pH. If you have a different calculator, it'll work fine. So on this one, the first thing we do is enter our coefficient of 3.5. Now on this calculator, to get exponents, we use the double E key right here. If you hit that, you'll notice that an exponent box appears. Some calculators have an EXP key instead of EE. It just depends on the brand. Now we can put in our exponent of 6, but since we want it to be negative 6, we'll hit this plus minus key here, and now it's become a negative 6. And then we simply hit the log button and we get negative 5.46 if we round off to the hundredth. Since the pH is the negative log, we're going to change that sign, and now we get a pH of 5.46, which is exactly what we came up with previously in our lesson. Determining whether a solution is acidic, basic, or neutral is pretty straightforward. Since 1 times 10 to the minus 7th is neutral, anything greater than that will be acidic. Conversely, if the H plus concentration is less than 1 times 10 to the minus 7th, then the solution is basic. Since the H plus and the OH minus concentrations are linked, we can also determine whether something is acidic, basic, or neutral from the hydroxide concentration, but it's simply the opposite. So if the hydroxide is greater than 1 times 10 to the minus 7, then the solution is basic.
And of course, if the hydroxide concentration is less than 1 times 10 to the minus 7, the solution will be acidic. So whatever is true for the H+, plus, the opposite is true for the hydroxide. So an H plus greater than 1 times 10 to the minus 7th is acidic. So a hydroxide greater than 1 times 10 to the minus 7th is basic. So just to recap what we've covered here, in pure water, the H plus and the OH minus are both 1 times 10 to the minus 7th, giving us a pH of 7, so it's neutral. For the vinegar, if we look at the H+, plus, it's greater than 1 times 10 to the minus 7th, which tells us it's acidic, and the hydroxide concentration is less than 10 to the minus 7th, which tells us it's also acidic, and of course the pH of 4 tells us the same thing. For the ammonia, an H+, plus of less than, than 1 times 10 to the minus 7th tells us that it's a basic solution, and the hydroxide concentration of more than 1 times 10 to the minus 7th also tells us it's basic, as does the pH of 11. And then finally, for the tap water, the H plus is greater than 1 times 10 to the minus 7th, making it acidic. The hydroxide is less than 1 times 10 to the minus 7th, also telling us it's acidic. And of course, the pH is less than 7, again confirming that it's acidic. There is another way that one can determine whether a solution is acidic, basic, or neutral, and that's called the pOH. It's very similar to the pH, but we simply take the negative log of the hydroxide concentration instead of the hydro hydrogen ion concentration. So for pure water, the pH and the pOH are actually the same, since they're both 1 times 10 to the minus 7th. For vinegar, the pOH is based on the 10 to the minus 10th, so it's a pOH of 10. For ammonia, the pOH would be 3. And for the tap water, we have to use our calculator and plug that in, and we come up with a pOH of 8.54. Uh, two very important things to notice. You may have realized that if you add the pH and the pOH in each of the four cases, it always adds up to 14, which means if you know one of them, you automatically know the other. And the other thing you may not have noticed is that if you multiply the H plus concentration times the hydroxide ion concentration, it always comes out to be 1 times 10 to the negative 14th. So again, if you know one of these, you can simply figure out the other one. So the pH scale is the most commonly one that's used, but the pOH scale will tell you exactly the same information. All right, let's try a few uh, practice problems now to see what you guys have learned. So why don't you pause the video for a few minutes and work through these, and then we'll come back and figure out what the answers are. All right, let's see how you've done on these. For the first one, the hydroxide concentration is greater than 1 times 10 to the minus 7th, so that means it's a basic solution. And if we calculate the pOH, a pOH of less than 7 also means basic. For the second one, the H plus concentration is less than 1 times 10 to the minus 7th, so less H plus means less acidic, therefore basic. And the pH is a little bit greater than 7, also telling us it's a basic solution. For the third one, if the OH and the H plus are equal, it's neutral. If the H plus is greater, it's acidic. And if the OH is greater, it's basic. And in this case, since the H plus is greater, that means it's acidic. With the pH and the pOH values, we know the two of them have to add up to 14. So if the pH is greater than the pOH, that means the pH would have to be greater than 7 and the pOH less than 7. For example, it could be 8 and 6 or 9 and 5. So a pH greater than 7, of course, means basic. Um, grandma's chicken soup food products are normally acidic. And of course, grandma's chicken fat soap 
Soap is a cleaning product, and cleaning products are invariably basic. As I mentioned earlier, there is more than one definition for acids and bases. Arrhenius came up with his definition back in 1887, and then in the 1920s, Bronsted and Lowry came up with a new definition. Their definition is a little broader and simpler. For their acid definition is simply a hydrogen ion donor. So any substance that gives a hydrogen ion to another substance is an acid. The key difference between this and the Arrhenius definition is Arrhenius always involved water. An acid was a substance that uh, produced hydrogen ions when dissolved in water. Bronsted and Lowry realized that not all chemical reactions occur in water. Most do, but not all. So their definition essentially broadened the, the scope. So more substances can be classified as acids and bases in the Bronsted-Lowry world than they can in Arrhenius. For example, in the Arrhenius definition, we classified hydrochloric acid as an acid because it produced hydrogen ions, or hydronium ions, when dissolved in water. Bronsted and Lowry will agree. Basically, anything that Arrhenius says is an acid, Bronsted and Lowry will agree with that. From the Bronsted-Lowry standpoint, HCl donated a hydrogen ion to the water molecule and converted it into a hydronium ion. So it was a hydrogen ion donor. Same thing is true with acetic acid. According to Arrhenius, acetic acid is an acid because it produced hydrogen or hydronium ions in water. Bronsted Lowry say it's an acid because it donated a hydrogen ion to the water molecule. Now sometimes Bronsted and Lowry will classify something as an acid even though Arrhenius would not. For example, in this reaction, there's no water. And therefore, Arrhenius would have nothing to say about this one way or the other. But Bronsted and Lowry look at it and say, ah, the HCl molecule donated a hydrogen ion to ammonia and converted it to ammonium. And therefore, we would consider HCl to be a, an acid, i.e. a hydrogen ion donor. If you take a look at this diagram, it sort of gives you an explanation of this. The Arrhenius world is more restrictive. So inside this inner circle are all the substances that are Arrhenius acids. Bronsted and Lowry is simply a broader scope. It looks at more substances as being acids. So anything that Arrhenius says is an acid, Bronsted and Lowry would agree. But there are things that Bronsted and Lowry's definition would classify as an acid that Arrhenius would not, such as this last example that we just did. A Bronsted-Lowry base is simply just the opposite. Acids and bases are essential, essentially chemical opposites. So if an acid is a hydrogen ion donor, it makes sense that a base would be a hydrogen ion acceptor, anything that takes a hydrogen ion from another substance. For example, our first uh, reaction we looked at as an Arrhenius base was the ammonia and water, and Arrhenius classified ammonia as a base because it produced hydroxide ions when dissolved in water. Arrhenius would agree, but for different reasons. I'm mean, sorry, Bronsted-Lowry would agree, because Bronsted and Lowry look at this and say, ah, the ammonia molecule accepted a hydrogen ion from water, and it became an ammonium ion. So as a hydrogen ion acceptor, Bronsted and Lowry would also concur that ammonia is a base. If we take a look at our previous reaction of hydrochloric acid and water. The interesting thing about the Bronsted-Lowry definition is there's always both an acid and a base in every reaction. Because if somebody's donating a hydrogen, somebody else has to accept it. So in this particular reaction, water is accepting a hydrogen ion from hydrochloric acid, 
Therefore, we would classify water as a base. If we take a look at that last reaction from our previous examples, the ammonia and hydrogen chloride, the ammonia molecule is accepting a hydrogen from HCl to form an ammonium ion. Bronsted and Lowry would say that ammonia in this case is acting as a base. So the interesting thing about Bronsted-Lowry is you, as I mentioned a moment ago, there's always both an acid and a base. You can't have a donor without an acceptor. You can't have an acceptor without a donor. So in this case, ammonia is accepting a hydrogen from the water, making it a base. Water is donating the hydrogen ion. That makes it the acid. In our second example, it's interesting. Now you notice that water is a base here where it was an acid here. Water has that ability. It can act as both an acid and a base. In fact, a lot of things can do that. In this case, the water was donating a hydrogen. In this case, it was accepting it. So HCl was the hydrogen ion donor, making it the acid. Water was the hydrogen ion acceptor, making it the base. In our third example, ammonia was accepting a hydrogen to form ammonium ion. HCl donated that hydrogen to the ammonia, and that made HCl, in this particular case, the acid. Here is an interesting example, because from the Arrhenius definition, you would look at both of these and say, wow, those are both strong acids. This is nitric acid, this is hydrochloric acid. Yet sometimes an acid will be forced to act like a base. If you take a look at this one, nitric acid is actually gaining a hydrogen ion. It is a hydrogen ion acceptor. So in this particular case, the, hydro the nitric acid would be considered a base. HCl, in this case, is donating the hydrogen. It's the acid. So how does that work with our definition of strong acids and strong bases from the Arrhenius definition? Well, that, 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 that um, delineation between strong and weak only works for the Arrhenius definition. What makes an acid strong in the Arrhenius world is simply if it's stronger than water. What makes a base strong is if it's stronger than water, because you can see water can do both of those. It can be an acid or a base. So strong acids are strong when you compare them to water. Strong bases are strong when compared to water. This arm wrestling example will help, I think, illustrate this. In, in water, nitric acid is by far much stronger than water. So nitric acid is going to beat water hands down, as will all of the other strong acids. So in the Arrhenius world, everybody's picking on this poor little uh, weenie water. In the Bronsted-Lowry world, however, now we're pitting those strong acids against each other. Now you have another opponent that's also very strong. When you pit these two powerful opponents against each other, somebody is going to have to lose. And as we just saw in the previous reaction, HCl was stronger than nitric acid. They were both trying to get rid of a hydrogen ion. They both can't do that. And therefore, HCl was able to donate a hydrogen ion to nitric acid, forcing nitric acid to take on the role of a base in this particular case. So who's stronger or weaker in the Bronsted-Lowry theory all depends on who your opponent is. You may be an acid in one case, and you may be a base in another case. Back in chapter 11, I introduced this idea of what we call the energy hill. Back in, in that chapter, we were looking at electrons going up and down the hill, but the fact is we can put basically anything on the energy hill, including chemical reactions. Chemical reactions always want to go in a particular direction, and that, of course, is going to be in the downhill direction. If we take a look at this first acid reaction we looked at in the Arrhenius section of the chapter, we found that hydrochloric acid and water definitely want to react with each other to form hydronium ions and chloride ions. 
that tells us the reaction wants to go in this direction. And of course, the direction that a reaction wants to go is always in the downhill direction. The same way if you put a ball at the top of a hill and it rolls down the hill, or you have an excited electron and it falls back to the ground state, a chemical reaction will always want to go in the direction that is at the bottom of the hill, i.e. the lowest energy. So the HCl and the water in this particular case would be at the top of the hill. That tells us that they're not as stable as they could be. That if they could react with each other, they could form stronger bonds and get rid of some of their stored potential energy. That means, of course, that the hydronium ion and the chloride ion are at the bottom of the hill. Now, in theory, as I've said in Chapter 4, all chemical reactions are reversible. But some of them are more easily reversed than others. For the hydronium ion and the chloride ion to turn back into HCl and water would require an enormous amount of energy. At room temperature, the molecules or the ions simply don't have enough energy. If you have a solution, the hydronium ions are bouncing off of the chloride ions, and in theory, they could collide with each other and turn back into HCl and water. But it would take a huge amount of energy. They would have to be moving very fast to make that happen. And at room temperature, they're simply not moving that fast. So although the reaction is, in theory, reversible, it's going 99.9999999% in the downhill direction. So for practical purposes, we just use an arrow in one direction. So for, for essentially, every one of these molecules is going in the right direction. Now, on the other hand, if we have a reaction where the energy hill is not so steep, then it's more easy, or, or it's easier for the molecules or ions to move back up the hill. For example, if we take a look at our ammonia and water reaction that we used earlier, we know that uh, ammonia is a weak base. It's about 1% hydroxide ions, and 99% of them stay as ammonia. So it's not 99.9999999%, it's just 99%. That 1% hydroxide ions is very easily measured. We can detect that. So the question, of course, is who goes at the top and who goes at the bottom? The ammonia and the water have to go at one end of the hill. The ammonium and hydroxide go in the other. Essentially, we know that whoever is at the bottom of the hill, that must be the favored direction, the ones that the reaction wants to be. And if we take a look at it, we can see that 99 out of 100 of the molecules want to remain as ammonia molecules. So this is clearly the more stable end, and therefore the ammonia and the water are at the bottom of the hill. We only get 1% ammonium hydroxide, which means that's not the favored direction, and therefore they're at the top of the hill. Now, is it possible at room temperature for an ammonia molecule to collide with a water molecule and become ammonium ions and hydroxide ions. It is possible. In fact, it happens about one out of every hundred times, where over here it might be one out of every trillion times, so tiny that we wouldn't even be able to measure it. If you've ever watched the show American Ninja Warrior, you know that one where they have to run up the ramp and grab the top? You've got to be really strong to do that. It's, it's a very rare person that is able to do that. I certainly couldn't do it. On the other hand, if, if this were the American Ninja Warrior hill and it was like three feet tall, yeah, I could walk up the hill and hop up on the top. That'd be really easy. So having a, a shallower slope on the energy hill means that it's much easier for the molecules to make their way up the hill. So anytime we have a reaction where it's possible to actually go both directions in a large enough amount to be measured, we represent it with this double arrow. The last topic we're going to cover in Chapter 5 is something called conjugate acids and bases. The term conjugate simply means that two things are linked together. When we're dealing with, with reactions that can go readily in both directions, 
It's possible to read the reaction going from left to right, but we can also read it going from right to left because it readily goes in each of those directions. So from the Bronsted-Lowry definition, we classified ammonia as a base going to the right because it accepted a hydrogen, and we classified water as an acid because it donated a hydrogen. But we can also look at the reaction in reverse. In the reverse direction, the ammonium ion is actually losing or donating a hydrogen to the hydroxide, and therefore it's acting as an acid. We use the term conjugate just so people know that we're referring to the material that is on the right side of the arrow. We could write this entire reaction in the reverse, in which case the ammonium over here would just be called the acid. So there's nothing wrong with being a conjugate acid. It simply lets people know you're talking about the materials that are on the right side of the arrow. The hydroxide ion going in the reverse direction is gaining or accepting a hydrogen. It's acting as a base then, so we call it the conjugate base. Whatever is the base on the left becomes the conjugate acid on the right. Whatever is the acid on the left becomes the conjugate base. Essentially, if you gain a hydrogen, now you can lose a hydrogen. If you lose a hydrogen, now you can gain one. So if you're a base on one side, you become an acid on the other, and vice versa. Take a look at the reaction that we did between nitric and hydrochloric acid. Nitric acid, in this particular case, accepted a hydrogen ion, so it was the base, and HCl donated a hydrogen ion, it was the acid. In the reverse direction, the H2NO3 plus ion is losing or donating a hydrogen to turn back into nitric acid. That makes it the conjugate acid. And the chloride, of course, is gaining a hydrogen or accepting a hydrogen to reform HCl. It's the conjugate base. One thing that makes a lot of these problems pretty easy is there's absolutely no way that chloride could be the acid. Because if you're an acid, you have to have a hydrogen to donate. So it's very clear you would never put conjugate acid next to the chloride ion. Our reaction with acetic acid. The acetic acid gave or donated a hydrogen ion to the water, so it was the acid. Water accepted that hydrogen ion, making it the base. In the reverse direction, the hydronium ion was donating that hydrogen to turn back into water, making it the conjugate acid, and the acetate ion gained or accepted a hydrogen to turn back into acetic acid, making it the conjugate base. I mentioned before with the acids that an acid could act as a base depending on who its opponent is. We're normally used to thinking of ammonia as a base, as we've done in our previous examples. But in this particular case, you'll notice that ammonia is actually losing or donating a hydrogen ion, and that means ammonia in this particular case would be classified as an acid. CH3 minus gained or accepted a hydrogen, therefore it's the base. In the reverse direction, the NH2 minus ion is gaining a hydrogen, making it the conjugate base, and CH4 is losing a hydrogen, making it the conjugate acid. So in the Arrhenius world, it was easy to recognize who was an acid. It was the one that started with hydrogen. And that's because molecules with, whose formulas begin with hydrogen just happen to be more acidic than water. So they're all being compared to water. And molecules that didn't begin with hydrogen happen to be less acidic than water, i.e. basic. In the Bronsted-Lowry world, it doesn't matter whether you start with an H or you don't start with an H. You can still be an acid or a base. It all depends on your opponent.
Well, that wraps up everything for Chapter 5 on acids and bases. So at this point, you should know about the Arrhenius and Bronsted-Lowry definitions of acids and bases. You should be able to write acid-base reactions, which are another example of a double displacement reaction. And you should be able to do pH and pOH calculations and also write out the acid-base, conjugate acid, and conjugate bases in various chemical reactions. In Chapter 6, we're going to move on and learn about some additional types of chemical reactions, and then that will wrap up all of our study of the various types of chemical reactions that we'll be dealing with in the course.